we have been talking a lot about uh, dynamic programming algorithms over the past few uh, lectures. And so today what I want to talk about is approximate dynamic programming. I want to introduce this topic to you. Uh, we are seeing a lot of innovations in approximate dynamic programming, innovations in the sense of both theory as well as practice. And particularly the in the practical settings, approximate DP is being used all over the place. And therefore, I think there is a lot of opportunity in implementing approximate dynamic programming for like uh, complex systems and deriving a lot of benefits that dynamic programming provides to the natural systems or, or rather the engineering systems. So in order to understand the field of approximate DP, of course, this field is extremely wide, extremely large, and there are lots and lots of ideas and results in this particular area. And there are, of course, domain knowledge. So if you look at chemical plants and how you can apply approximate DP to chemical plants, that sort of theory would be quite different from approximate DP for a mechanical system versus approximate DP for rocket systems and so on. So of course, there are these domain knowledge, but, the, of course, but, but those domain knowledge is actually built from some underlying basics. And what I want to talk about today are those underlying basics and of course, you know, given that most of you are from different fields, uh, you will actually go back into your field and you can try and derive some inspiration about how to implement some of these basic ideas into your specific field. So in order to, so let's, let's start with the essential formulations of DP. So if you want to formulate a DP, the first thing you need to determine is your state space XT and your action space ut. Okay, so what all, what all are the states of the system and what kind of variables can you control? So that will be the action space, okay? Once you have determined the state space and you have determined the action space, you have to figure out the underlying physics, chemistry, or biology, and you have to determine the state transition function and you have to determine the cost function. Okay, so this, the state transition function would come from the physical modeling of the system Right, and the cost function would come from what is the desired behavior that you want to induce in that system, and that would determine what the cost function of the system should be. Okay, so now you have the state space, the action space, the state transition function, the cost function. You have formulated a nice TP problem. Uh, also, you need the terminal cost CT. Okay, and then the third part is now that you have formulated the dynamic programming problem, you have to figure out a computing machinery, running some operating system, running some set of softwares, and you now need to implement a solver to solve this dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, so in order to solve that, uh, you need the following thing. So let me define BT as the Bellman operator that maps VT plus one. This is V. UT of CT XT UT plus VT plus one composition FT XT UT. So what this uh, BT operator does, this is an operator called Bellman operator. Let me write it. Bellman operator. Okay, and what this Bellman operator takes, it takes the value function at the next time step and maps it to the value function at time t.
Okay, so there, there are two arguments here. Bt takes as input Vt plus one, the value function at time t plus one, and then it outputs a function and that function is a function of xt. So let me write it here. Vt of xt is equal to the Spellman operator. Okay, in other words, I can write Vt equals to Bt composition, Bt plus one composition, composition Bt plus H, B capital T of B capital T. And needless to say, B capital T is CT. This is H. Okay, any questions so far? So I've just introduced a new operator here called Bellman operator, which is basically just one step of the dynamic program. It maps the value function at the next time step to the current time step. And overall, this VT can be written as an iterative application of the Bellman operator all the way until the Bellman operator at time capital T, which takes as input V, oh, it should take as input VT plus one bt plus one equals to ct plus one. Okay. And the next operator I want to introduce is basically the policy operator, pt of bt plus one xt, which is argument of ut of the cost. Okay, so this is gamma t, the policy, and the policy basically applies this operator pt to vt plus one, and it outputs the argument. So bt apply, bt gives you, the Bellman operator gives you the minimum value, and the pt operator gives you the argument, and you can store that in the, in the policy function. Okay, so I have introduced two new operators here. The Bellman operator and the policy operator. I, I, this, pol this operator doesn't really have a name, but I'm just going to call it policy operator for the purpose of this class. Any questions so far? So, so far we all agree that these are the three main ingredients of the uh, dynamic programming. So we need the state space, action space, state transition function, cost function, this sets up the DP I mean, this sets up the optimization problem, then you have to solve the optimization problem. And the way to do that is to iteratively apply the Bellman operator to compute the value function and iteratively apply the policy operator to determine the policy. And this policy then needs to be executed. This policy needs to be executed on the actual system. Okay, now the question is you have to actually implement it on a system or on a computer and you would like this algorithm to run very fast, reasonably fast for appropriate systems. So to give you an example, uh, if you're looking at how electricity markets are run and you have done a few examples in your assignment. So the optimization for tomorrow is typically it takes three hours to run the optimization for tomorrow's you know schedule of electricity and posting of prices computation of prices through the sensitivity theorem so so they set up this dp for 24 hours of electricity production electricity generation and consumption 
and they take three hours to solve this problem. On the other hand, if you're driving your vehicle and your engine is uh, and the uh, engine is optimized for, you know, let's say CO2 emissions or NOx emissions, uh, that sort of algorithm has to run every 100 milliseconds. Okay, so, so as you can see, given the application, the amount of time you have to run your DP is actually pretty different. So in one case, you can spend three hours on solving the DP. In the other case, you only have 100 milliseconds to solve the DP. All right. Now this DP has to run on a computer, right? And on computers, I mean, all of this works well in practice if everything was discrete and everything had very small cardinality, like the state space and action space has small cardinality. But in reality, things are continuous and the cardinality is not that small, okay? So you need to discretize, you need to do some sort of quantization uh, you need to somehow store these functions. So this VT needs to be stored and the policy also needs to be stored in the computer. And, and these are the main challenges that you would, as practitioners of dynamic programming, these are the challenges that you would face when you're designing actual systems and implementing dynamic programming. So let's go through how do you simplify each of these uh, steps uh, in in the actual implementation. So we'll start with number one, and we have the action space, which is what all things you can do. And we have the state space, uh, which is what all things you can observe through your sensors. Um, how can we simplify the state space? So what kind of ideas do you have for simplifying the state space? Let me give you a concrete example, okay? So one, I want to simplify state space. So let's say you are a t-shirt seller and you have like three types of t-shirts, small, medium, large, and you have one, you have like a hundred t-shirts. So you will have, you will have, you can have any anything between zero to 100 t-shirts zero to 100 t-shirts of medium size, zero to 100 t-shirts of large size, right? So what's the size of your state space? You have 101 times 101 times 101. What, what is this? Well, let me approximate it. This is roughly 10 raised to six. So your state space size is 1 million. How can I simplify this state space? So I'm a t-shirt seller and I just realized that if I want to solve a dynamic program to figure out how much t-shirt I should keep in my inventory, uh, turns out I have like a million state space, million dimension, I mean, there are million points in the state space. How can I simplify this state space? What do you think? Instead of each t-shirt being a state, didn't you just have the state being the number of t-shirts you have for small, medium, large? Right. So that's, yeah, that's the state space is uh, 10 raised to six number of points in the state space. So you can be anywhere between zero, zero, zero. So zero, small, zero, medium, zero, large. One small, zero, zero, two, zero, zero. 100, 100, zero, zero, and you keep going on and on, right? So that's this whole set has 10 raised to six elements. So oh, you're saying the space, the space has that many elements, but it's only three dimensional, right? Right, right, yeah. It's three dimensional, yeah. So the state is three dimensional. So X is, let's, let me just write zero. What's wrong? Whoa, it didn't like it. Okay, so my state space X is zero to 100 raised to three. 
but the size of the state space is oh my god whatever so this is my state space maybe i should be a bit more precise here okay now everything is right how can i simplify the state space uh, so as you can see the cardinality of my state space is 10 raised to 6 and that's a very large number for executing on a computer we can reduce the uh, discretization like, so how do you want to discretize it uh, you can we can go from 0 to 4 like just the even numbers for each so it will reduce the uh, state space size drastically like 50, 50, 50, 50. Great, great. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's a good point. And that's exactly what I was getting at. So I can say that instead of saying uh, I have a state space which has like elements all the way from 0 to 100, I'm going to make my state space as low, medium, high, raised to 3. So the cardinality of this is actually just 9, not 9, maybe it's 27. Okay, so the cardinality of state space is 27. And by low mean, I have a low inventory, which means that my state, say x1, is less than or equal to 10. Medium would be x1 or less than or equal to 20. Medium is 21 less than or equal to x1 less than or equal to 80. and high would be 81, 100. So instead of counting the exact number of t-shirt, I can just say whether I have low number of t-shirts, medium number of t-shirts, or high number of t-shirts. I can fix these quantization variables like 20 and 80. I can figure it out through experience. And I can drastically reduce the size of the state space to just 27 states. Those are the only possible states in the new problem, right? And this kind of scheme is called state aggregation. Okay, so I've aggregated states. So the original state space is very large. So I've aggregated states and I've created a very low dimensional or low, uh, 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 cardinality state space because now my deep and then now my dp is very easy to run because the size of the state space has reduced drastically you will need to reformulate your ft because ft was originally designed for this kind of state space but now you have done state aggregation, so your FT needs to change appropriately. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is, uh, so now you can imagine, I mean, this was a problem for a t-shirt seller, which had only three types of t-shirts, if you walk into a regular shop, they have like a hundred types of things. If you walk into a regular Walmart or a Kroger, they have thousands and thousands of different types of things. And they have to make sure that they they have in their inventory enough items so that customers are not going to go back empty handed. And you can imagine that they are essentially solving dynamic optimization problem on a day to day basis to make sure that their inventory is up to date and uh, the customers are not going back with empty hands. It's a huge deal in the inventory management industry to not to make sure that everything is stocked up to the optimal level. 
Now, of course, the problem there is if you want to keep a large inventory, you have to pay a large price because typically Walmarts and Kroger's are in the center of the city and real estate is very expensive. So you want to have as small inventory as possible, but you also don't want the customers to go back empty handed. And so they have to figure out that right balance and they run like massive optimization algorithms on a day-to-day -day basis in order to simplify, in order to figure out how much they should stock in their inventory. And they have to do some simplification of the state space in order to make sure that their problems are tractable and not untractable. <laughs> Where exactly does the cardinality of the states affect the um, the calculations? Yeah, like, well, yeah, good point. Good point. So I was talking about the curse of dimensionality mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. So for every state, you have to run this minimization at every point of time. So if your state has a million dimen I mean, a million elements, so you have to run this minimization a million number of times for computing the value function. Oh, right, because you're trying each value. Right. Okay. Right, right. And then not only that, you have to now store the value function in your computer. So that's a list, right? The value at state one, value at state two, value at state one million. And so now you have a million dimensional vector to store. But if, if you reduce the state space size to only 27, then you only have to do this minimization 27 times, which is great. But you also have to only uh, store a 24 dimensional vector, which is also great. You don't have to store a million dimensional vector. So it, it, it becomes useful in two separate ways. Okay. So this is known as state aggregation. Now this is something that I talked about for a inventory control problem, but you have similar problems in smart grid. And this is just an empirical observation from some of the papers that have been written in the past uh, 10 or so years in the smart grid area. So there is, so you know, the electricity that you get at your house, it is of the form A sine omega t plus theta. And this theta is known as phase. And this A is known as amplitude. So it could be voltage or it could be current. And uh, there are phasor measurement units which measures the amplitude and the phase at every like location within a smart grid. And it has been empirically observed that even though the output of a phasor measurement unit would be a vector that may be say a thousand dimensional, uh, let's let's keep it small. Let's keep it 60 dimensional. So you have this measurement that is coming from phasor measurement unit and that is 60 dimensional vector at every uh, sort of millisecond or at every 10 milliseconds, you're getting this data. But it turns out if you plot these vectors in this 60 dimensional space, it turns out that there is a plane which is only four dimensional. This is only R4 or maybe R5. So very small dimensional plane. And all the data points actually lie on this plane. So you are getting this measurement which is 60 dimensional, but in fact, they are all lying in a plane which is only five dimensional object in this 50 dimensional space. So this is, let's say R5 and, and the normal to this plane would be R55. Okay, so as you can see, a lot of the dimensions are essentially empty. Uh, it doesn't mean that the data is not there. It's just that it doesn't sit like the plane. If you, if you plot the data, it seems to be lying on a plane. So therefore the actual state space is much smaller dimensional than what is apparent just by looking at the vectors themselves. And so this is actually very useful in cyber attack detection and whatnot, but it could potentially also be useful for optimization. So this is also a state aggregation scheme where you essentially project this state to a five dimensional plane. So this is the state, let's say XT. 
and you do a transformation dxt x tilde t this t is the projection operator so this is a matrix in 5 cross 60 dimension and this is your aggregated state x tilde t is your aggregated state and these are matrix projection matrix and and i don't know how many of you have taken machine learning or linear algebra or statistics statistics courses typically you get these projection matrices from what is known as principal component analysis i won't go into the pca part but uh, but you can use PCA for principal component analysis to come up with this projection matrix and so that you can come up with a low dimensional representation of your state space and use that for the dynamic programming case. So in this case, you have a physical system which has some underlying physics. And it just so turns out that the underlying physics at a very large scale is so synchronized that the actual state lies on a very low dimensional manifold. And you can potentially project your data onto this lower dimensional manifold and get a low dimensional state space instead of that original high dimensional state space. So that's also very useful. Okay, does this make sense? Any question? Okay, so depending on, I mean, if you have a physical system, then perhaps the data, the state actually lies during the operations, it just lies in a low dimensional plane. And therefore you don't really have to keep track of this high dimensional state space. You can actually project it and do the low dimensional dynamic. You can run the dynamic program in the low dimensional state space. Now, how do you do that? I won't give you a, a idea about that because it's really very domain specific but I just want to give you the underlying like basics so, so that you can build upon it in your research or wherever you go for a job. Okay, so simplifying state space is one possibility. Okay, and then you have to change the corresponding state transition function. The second possibility is you change the state transition function itself. So you keep the state space as it is, but you instead do a simplified modeling or you use singular perturbation. Okay, so one idea of simplified modeling, I will just uh, sort of motivate that with this simple pendulum example. So typically simple pendulum, when you are talking about simple pendulum in physics, you assume massless string and you assume point mass. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is a simple pendulum. On the other hand, in reality, what you have is a compound pendulum where you don't really have a massless string and you don't really have a point mass. Okay, so this is this would require a much more complicated modeling exercise. Okay, so instead of going through this complicated modeling exercise to figure out the equation of motion, you actually do a much more simplified modeling with massless string and point mass and you get the equations of motion. And that becomes your simplified model. So that just trying to simplify the model. So you could either simplify the model by reducing the size of the state space and or you can actually come up with a much more uh, simpler model by making some physical assumptions or chemical assumptions or biological assumptions and create a system which is much simpler than what the actual system is. And this kind of stuff is typically done, for instance, in uh, insulin, let's say you want to create an insulin pump, which which pumps 
exactly the right amount of insulin that is needed to regulate the blood glucose level. Now, in reality, you will have to actually model the entire pancreas and figure out, okay, what happens when you eat, what happens to the pancreas, what signal goes to the brain, how much insulin gets secreted, how does that regulate the blood glucose level and things like that. I mean, that becomes like a horribly complex problem. So then what you do is, okay, fine, I'm just going to look at the uh, look at the time series of blood glucose level based on different insulin inputs. And I'm going to come up with some very simplified differential equation model that governs the dynamics of insulin regulation in the body, right? So you have essentially, you started with a very complicated biological system that maintains the glucose, blood glucose level in all of our bodies. And then you check that out, complicated model, and instead just do like basic differential equation, like try to derive some differential equation which will govern the glucose level in the blood, which is typically the approach used um, in, in reality. Okay, so that's the simplified model approach where you um, just make some assumptions and, and come up with a simple model for the system. The second approach, which is the singular perturbation of, so any question on this before I jump onto singular perturbation approach? Have, so let me ask you this question. Have you in your field seen something similar where you have a dynamic system with very complex dynamics and you kind of just made some assumptions in order to simplify the dynamics and therefore you were able to solve the problem uh, in a much more simpler fashion. Have you seen any example? Can someone tell me an example in their field? No one has any example of this type? Okay. Well, I've seen a lot of such examples, particularly in vehicle research. Again, vehicles are assumed to be point mass in many research problems. Um, if you want to have more complicated research problem, then vehicles are assumed to have a bicycle model. And if you want to do even more complicated research, then the vehicles will, uh, will be assumed to have like four wheels. So it goes from one wheel to two wheel to four wheel. Okay, so what's the idea in singular perturbation? So your state space X, T actually comprises of two states, Y, T and Z, T. And the evolution happens as follows. Uh, I have already used F, I need to use some other function. G, let me use G1. G1, Yt, Zt, Ut. This is epsilon, this is a small number. And then this is equal to G2, Yt, Zt, Ut. What do you think will happen over a time horizon zero to capital T? Assume that the time horizon T is not very large and epsilon is very, very small. What do you think will happen over the decision horizon? T is small. Say epsilon is 10 raised to minus 6 t equals to 100 or, or maybe 50. Hmm. 
what do you think is going to happen in this system what's happening in this system why maybe, maybe why will remain constant because not changing it by a lot right right so y is going to remain constant where what happens to z z actually changes quite a lot right during mm -hmm. the time horizon okay okay so that's good so yt roughly is equal to y0 roughly whereas zt is changing quite a lot changes a lot or could change a lot it depends on the situation so when do we see such a situation arising so let's imagine you are driving your vehicle on the road and you are trying to keep your speed constant right so you're driving on a highway or you may be driving like away from the traffic light and your speed is more or less constant you may be going from say 30 miles per hour to 35 miles an hour or something like that over a period of 40 50 or one minute 40 50 seconds to one minute right so your speed is roughly constant but if you go go down into your engine you will see that actually engine is injecting fuel and firing the spark plug and all of that stuff every 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, right? So the engine is working at a much faster time scale, whereas your velocity is changing at a much slower time scale, right? Do you see this, this decoupling of the dynamics? And so your this is like your speed and this is like your engine, uh, engine torque, let's say. Right, so the engine torque needs to be determined based on how much fuel to inject. UT would be the amount of fuel to inject into the engine. So all of that needs to be determined every 100 milliseconds or every 50 milliseconds. Whereas the speed is roughly going to remain constant throughout the time. And, and this is uh, known as singularly perturbed system. This kind of system, system that exhibits this kind of behavior is known as singularly perturbed system, okay? Where one of the states or a few states are roughly constant throughout the decision horizon, whereas the other state may change pretty rapidly. And so in this type of situation, one of the approaches that are typically used is you assume that ZT is going to follow the command given by the higher. So you basically split this optimization problem into a two optimization problem. One is the high level optimization. For slow dynamics. And this gives a reference to the low level system. let me call it tracking optimization. For fast dynamics. So this is basically controlling YT and this is controlling ZT. And this gives you the final control UT. So you basically split the optimization into a high level optimization and a low level optimization the low level optimization is essentially trying to track the reference signal given from the high level optimization. So the high level optimization will say, keep your velocity at 35 miles an hour, okay? And then that reference will go to the engine and that engine and the reference that will be go, that will go into the engine will say, keep the torque constant at 2000 Newton meters per second or something like that. And then that information will go to the engine and then engine is basically just trying to track that reference. And uh, that will be deciding, that will decide what the UT should be, overall UT is going to be. Okay, so that's typically used in a lot of complex system where there is a natural time scale separation. So uh, you put the optimization in the high level system and then you put a tracking optimization in the low level system. And typically this is where PID controller sits. 
So I think someone had asked me about PI. I think Jeffrey, if I'm not mistaken, Jeffrey had asked me that question about the PID controller, or maybe someone else had asked me about the PID controller. So typically this is where the PID controller is used, where it's basically just tracking the reference and giving the uh, control output. Okay, and this is where um, usually in people use like intelligent, when they say intelligent system, what they mean is they have put some high level optimization problem for figuring out the slow dynamics, the optimal slow dynamics to come up with the optimal reference for the PID controller to track. Okay, so this is uh, roughly another wet method for uh, reducing the complexity of the optimization problem, but it requires your system to have this singular perturbation behavior where you have a fast dynamics and a slow dynamic system. Okay, any question on this? When you say intelligent system then, is that, uh, is that when you would use DP? Right, so that is one way, that is one place where you use DP. So for it, let me give you an example. You know these thermostats, and now we have smart thermostats, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason why they are smart thermostat is because they have this high level optimization for setting the reference signal for your air conditioning system, right? So earlier they were not smart because they were just tracking the set point that you set in your home. And now you have all these intelligent sensors or intelligent design or intelligent home, which is basically applying DP in this high level optimization uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, keep the comfort level at whatever you deem is comfortable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So this is where DP, this is where DP is typically applied. So you can imagine, you can look at all areas. I'm sure you are old enough. So you can remember 2010 and you can remember 2020. And what you will see is you have these systems that were not intelligent and those systems started becoming intelligent. And what that actually means is you started incorporating DP in this high level optimization. Okay, just look at system by system and you will see a lot of examples of such things happening all over the place. Okay, let's move on to, so these are the two methods uh, uh, for simplifying the state transition function or simplifying the cost function. Now, the third thing is function storage. Uh, so Bellman, let me just write function storage. Uh, yeah. On computers. Okay, so now you have this VT where you are doing this computation of uh, iterative application of the Bellman operator. But, but in order to apply the Bellman operator, you actually have to store this VT because that's how you will compute uh, VT minus one VT, right? So you have to store this value function on a, on a computer, right? Now value function, uh, let's say my value function is log of X, five log of X, that's my value function VT of X. How am I going to store this function on a computer? What do you think? How will you store this function on a computer? If you're writing a DP code, what would you do? Come on, you should be able to answer this question. How would you store five log of X on your computer? Okay, I'm gonna cold call someone.
well yeah someone has an answer how how would you store five log x on a computer no do you, do you just mean like when when did you just write some kind of script right um, just like a function in python or something i guess it depends that's right you... yeah yeah so you will basically write a function whatever v equals to fx and then you basically return v equals to 5 log of x or maybe maybe i should write it a equals to 5 and v equals to a times log of x right so this is typically how you would store this function in a computer now uh, now when you have a complex function let's say i plot a function okay and the function looks something like this so i can tell you if you query me i can give you for any x i can give you the value of function i can give you the value of function how would you store this function now so I, I give you a black box you give it as input x and i give you an output b of x how would you store this function in in matlab so this is just a black box okay so you have to still store the function how would you store it and store it, it as a lookup table you will store it as a lookup table that's that's very good okay so let's say your x is between 0 to 10 so you will discretize the state space so you will say okay my x starts from 0 it ends at 10 so i'm going to discretize it and then at every of these points i'm going to compute the value of the function and i'm going to just store it as a lookup table in the computer right so that's the second idea so if you knew the function in closed form you can actually store it in that closed form in Mat in, in matlab or whatever other script you are using on the other hand if i give you a black box to which you can send an input as a state and you, the output will be the value at that particular point then you have to discretize the state space and you have to store the value of the function um, uh, in this particular format, okay? Now let's look at a simple example. Your x is zero to 10 raised to three and you discretize it zero, one, two, all the way to 10 raised to three. This is the discretization process. <coughs> So now the value function v of x will actually be a dip. No, the table will be 11 cube. How much is 11 cube? 1331, I think. So, <laughs> so now your value function is actually a 1300 dimensional vector, 1331 dimensional vector right so it's a very very large vector and that's how you would store your value function so perhaps you have to come up with a more efficient way of storing this function in the computer so that you can keep running the dp again and again so this leads me to what is known as function approximation theory I am sure all of you have uh, have done this before and you have done this lookup table before, uh, but function approximation theory is something that is gaining a lot of traction. It's pretty old, I think 1960s onwards, it was being developed, uh, but now because of machine learning and, and so on, uh, you know, this, this field has become quite advanced. And the idea is I can actually write V of x as summation of some coefficient ai times some function phi i of x. These are known as basis function and there are a lot of different types of basis functions on the planet now. And these are mm -hmm. coefficients. And you can take as many number of basis functions as you want, okay? 
And this kind of way of storing value function is very, very common right now these days. Um, have you seen something like this before? Have you seen storing a function in terms of basis functions before in your, uh, in your previous courses? I know that some of you may have seen it before, but I just want to make sure that you can recognize that you have done it before or not. Yeah. Okay. In what way? Uh, well, even like a Fourier transform. Perfect. Uh, that was the answer I was looking for. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, even in the Fourier transform, you have a set of basis functions. Right. And then if you want to reconstruct the signal. Right. Right. Then you need to know what the coefficients are to reconstruct it. Perfect. Perfect. So Fourier transform slash CDs, Laplace transform. You can basically store all the, uh, all the time signals, either sinusoidal or exponential signals. You can store it in a very compact form by either using Fourier transform or Fourier series or Laplace transform, right? So something that you have all studied before if you have taken a signals of systems class or you have taken a feedback controls class, right? So you have seen this before. Now let's look at some modern inventions. So this is the neural network, shallow neural network in which this is some sigmoid function sigma of wi transpose x. Okay, so this is a, a shallow, this is called a shallow neural network sigma of y is some, uh, some non-polynomial function. Nominal function of y. Okay, so this is a shallow neural network. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, if, you're, if you know that your value function is quadratic, x transpose qx plus b transpose x, then all you need to do is store the q, uh, the q uh, matrix and the b matrix. Okay, so you don't really have to store the tabular form. You can actually store it much more efficiently by just storing the, um, the matrix q and the matrix p. So this is the quadratic case. Okay, um, so, so you have seen this function approximation theory before and now these function approximation theory, you have like more different types of functions that you can use as basis functions and coefficients, come up with corresponding coefficients and then you can very efficiently store the value function in a computer. And, and this sort of idea has now become a, uh, very common in the field of machine learning, reinforcement learning, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. So wherever they are applying dynamic programming, they just put a very nice function approximator there, like a neural network or, or some reproducing kernel Hilbert space-based function approximator. And it just does wonders. It, it just does very beautiful dynamic, like you can run the dynamic programming very efficiently, very easily. And uh, that has pretty much revolutionized this whole area of dynamic programming. Okay, now you cannot, I mean, you have to do it for value function, but you can do the same thing for policy as well. Can do the same to store policy gamma t. Okay, so there is some, uh, uh, dynamic optimization involved in order to compute the optimal coefficients and the optimal basis functions. Um, and, and so you basically run some of these optimization tools, uh, very lightweight, very easy to run optimization stuff. You can run it in order to store the value function and the, and the policy functions very efficiently on the computer. So this is strictly better than the tabular form, especially for very complex systems. So to give you an example, I was recently solving a 
vehicle rebalancing problem for Uber and Lyft type of ride sharing system, uh, the state space I was looking at was probably 1500 dimensional. Actually, I should write N. N raised to 1500. And the action space was N raised to, I don't know, 1000 or something. Like it was somewhere, some very obscene number, maybe 400. So I was running a dynamic program, which was this complicated. And just a neural network, we just used a neural network to approximate the value function and the policy function, and it just worked beautifully. We didn't have to uh, worry too much about the, of course, training that whole thing took like running this dynamic programming took us uh, one week, but that wasn't a problem. We could run this algorithm offline on a supercomputer and then we could deploy it in real world practice, practical systems. So. So you can really do a lot of wonders by using these function approximators to efficiently store the value function or the policy functions on computers. So that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, I'm going to talk about rollout algorithm and rolling horizon control, which is basically the next thing on the plate to approximate dynamic programming. Uh, I'll be sticking around for questions, but uh, if you, if, if you don't have any questions, feel free to drop. So the function approximation, that will help limit the amount of space needed on the computer? Uh, very good question. So <clears throat> there are two things uh, that you need to, okay, so let's, Let's think about it. What's the point of having this function approximator? So space is of course an obvious answer, but space is not the only thing. So I want to run minimization of C of XU plus, I want to run this method, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to run the gradient descent, if I want to compute the optimal U using gradient descent, I want my VT to be differentiable. Now, if I store VT in a tabular format, uh, I may not be able to differentiate it that easily. But if my VT is a nice analytic function of this form, of this form, then I can differentiate it very easily and then for I can run the gradient descent algorithm to solve this problem. So yes, uh, it's much more efficient than tabular form. Um, it's much easy to query the value. So if I want to identify what's the VT plus one of FT of X comma U, if I want to find out this value, it's very easy to do it using neural network. But if you have to do it using a tabular method, then you have to figure out, okay, what row, what column, what depth am I looking at? And uh, it's very easy to query when your dimension is very large. It's much easier to query the value using a function approximator rather than using some tabular format. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. because I thought traditionally a lookup table would be faster than running it through a function. For embedded systems, yes. Like if, if, if you are just using like one dimensional state space or two dimensional state space, that's right. But if you have this 1500 dimensional state space and 400 dimensional action space, then no, then it'll be okay. too difficult, yeah. And so a lot of innovation is actually happening in this region. Uh, as far as embedded systems optimization is concerned, it's more or less a done deal, but I may be wrong. I, I may be wrong about this. It really depends on the industry. So if you go to oil and natural gas, um, I, I'm probably sure that they have optimized everything everywhere, but, but but I just recently saw an article where they're talking about, oh, now we can have these new sensors on oil and natural gas exploration things. And with these new sensors, you can run even better optimization algorithms. So maybe there's something else there that I don't know about. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, hello, Professor. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the final project. And uh, may I ask that after you stop recording? Yeah, I'll probably answer that after I stop recording. Okay, yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll stop recording now.